Ever since I was a little kid, I have always been a fan of public speaking. I would always contradict what everyone said to the point where my very first word was a very poignant and articulated no. After being in a doctor's office, when I went in for a checkup and was told I needed to get a shot. How, my love of, I'm sorry, that like threw me off. Ashwina, can you start the video again? Sorry. <laughs> If there are two things people know about me, it's that one, I love Britney Spears, and two, I love to argue. I especially love the latter. You see, ever since I was a little kid, I would always contradict what everyone said, to the point where my first word was a very poignant and articulated no, when I went in for a checkup at the doctor's office and was told I needed to get a shot. During my freshman year of high school, my love of arguing led me to joining my high school speech and debate team, where I found some of the best people I've ever met. However, I also found that as I became more active in the activity, certain trends started showing up in judge comments about why I was ranked the way that I was. You see, while my male colleagues were praised for being commanding and for being assertive in rounds, I was dropped for doing so and called, quote, edgy and controlling. And sure, I can concede the fact that I get a little overly passionate in rounds sometimes, but as I was talking to my fellow female debaters and listening to their stories and experiences, I realized that the experiences that I had were all too common. From a judge dropping a competitor in rankings for not wearing heels, despite her male colleagues wearing tennis shoes, to male competitors essentially manipulating female competitors for clout on the national circuit, women are forced to put up with so much in debate. A study done by AJB and Alyssa Nee in October of 2020 found that when at least one debate partner was female, the chances of winning the round fell by 10% against a team comprised of two males. And when both partners were female, chances fell by 17.1%. Furthermore, female debaters were 30.4% more likely to quit speech and debate than their male counterparts, which is something I find truly devastating. When looking at public speaking across the board, we see that these disparities are reflected in their totality. A study done by New York City-based provider of event software, Visibo, in 2016 that examined thousands of the world's largest industries across 58 different countries and 45 in different industries found that women made up only 34% of all conference and convention speakers and only made up 15% of all summit speakers. I would like to examine the history that is tied to women in public speaking to help shine a light on the roots of these disparities. I would also like to highlight that the stories of female speakers, specifically that of high school friends of competitors, show the reality of what it truly means to be a female speaker. So listen up, because it's time for a girl talk. So the first major historical event I would like to examine comes from the 9th century, with every English teacher's favorite fan fiction writer, Homer. You see, when reading Homer's writings, we see countless examples of women being silenced. Even in book one of the Odyssey, as the hero's wife Penelope awaits for Odysseus to return, she speaks in a public area of their palace. Her son, Telemachus, 10 years old at the time, then proceeds to essentially cut her off, insinuating that speech is quote unquote, men's business. While yes, the Odyssey, like the majority of Homer's writings, is a work of fiction, Homer's language and stories reflects blatant cultural norms. And as so eloquently stated by Cambridge professor Mary Beard, it is the very first moment in Western culture when some young boy has told a woman to quote, shut up. The idea that women are not welcome to speak in public is simply an abhorrent way to control them. If you prohibit women from speaking to each other, then that deliberately cuts off all forms of communication, separating them from each other, creating a dependency on a very weak system designed to prioritize only a niche group of individuals. They taught, they stigmatized female speech in order to keep women silent. They taught women to fear judgment for talking to each other, labeling us as gossipy in order to keep us docile. Now, the next major historical event I would like to examine comes from the 1800s, the trends of women being admitted into insane asylums. Essentially, what would happen all too often is that women who spoke out or rejected the idea of being below their male counterparts were thought to be clinically insane and thus put in mental institutions. Kate Moore, the esteemed author of The Women They Could Not Silence, phrased this phenomenon in an ingenious way. Women who studied or read or who simply had minds of their own and a determination to use them were thought to be demonstrating eccentricity of conduct. 
which meant they were morally insane, a diagnosis invented by James Cowles Pritchard in 1835. They were to be locked away until they conformed to a more natural feminine behavior. The reality is that these women were forcibly put into these institutions in an effort to silence them. Husbands could commit their wives simply by requesting it and without basic evidence of insanity. Women were subject to strip jackets, chloroform, and in some cases, mutilation, all because of the fact that they had the audacity to speak. This is one of the biggest examples of women being silenced and voices being stomachly barred. The sole reason as to why these women were sent away in the first place was to mute them. And as so perfectly phrased by Moore, every genuine emotion had to be stifled. Every act of difference from society's prescribed model of femininity had to be suppressed. After all, women who had strong personalities and strong resolutions, plenty of what is termed nerve, were literally textbook examples of female insanity. It is that stifling of the female voice that drives women away from public speaking out to this very day. Now, let's look at one last example, a more modern one, if you will. The story of pop icon Britney Jean Spears. You see, while Spears is not necessarily a public speaker in her own right, her story and the reality of her situation highlights the inherent silencing of the female voice. In 2008, Britney Spears was placed under a two-part conservatorship due to a result of a mental breakdown as a result of harassment by the press and losing custody of her children. Under this conservatorship, Britney Spears lost control over practically every aspect of her life. From the color she could have her kitchen cabinets painted, to whether or not she could drive a car, to forcibly having an IUD placed inside of her, the voice that Britney had to control her life was taken from her. One of the most notable parts about this case is that when Britney finally came out and shared with the world what was happening, male lawyers reported to the press that she essentially harmed her case due to her emotionalism, and that some of the first comments she released regarding her stance on her conservatorship were, quote, explosive and emotional. While yes, Britney's entrance into her conservatorship did come at a time when she was not mentally healthy, the press, specifically the male press, saw her anger and emotion towards her situation as something that was controllable. As if after everything that happened, she couldn't be mad at her situation. I mean, it took her, what, 13 years before she could get a lawyer to speak for herself? 13 years of having to pay for a lawyer her father hired to keep her locked in her conservatorship. And when she finally does get this chance to share her thoughts on her experience, the first reaction is to tell her to present herself calmly. That is an inert silencing of women in its own right not just through the words we may say or the actions we can take, but how we are allowed to express them and what emotions we can carry. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the male celebrities do not receive this treatment in the slightest when they struggle. Take a look at cases such as Robert Downey Jr., John Mulaney, Johnny Depp, Tiger Woods, Kanye West, Macaulay Culkin, and so many more who have openly struggled with addictions and dysregulated behavior. And yet the press has the decency to treat them as human beings and maintain their autonomy and rights to their emotions. The idea that women's emotions must be invalidated, mitigated, and controlled is one of the biggest issues facing female debaters in the status quo. Don't believe me? Here are some of the stories of female debaters that I've interviewed for this exact talk. From being told they're too condescending, to being seen solely as a statistic for an impact in an argument and not as an actual human being, to being seen as easy to beat solely because they are women, female debaters bear the brunt of this historical suppression of voices. Whilst all of these debaters have remarkable and individual stories, one theme holds true. Our emotions and our composure have to be regulated to fit into a man's business suit. If we are too passionate, we are angry, aggressive, and assertive. If we are too quiet, we are timid, pushovers, unconvincing. These labels that have been placed on women are an inherent net harm because it takes the power of the words that are spoken and invalidates them. So, what can we do to help solve this issue? 
For starters, know your inherent biases when listening to speakers. Is the person speaking before you truly angry, or are they assertive? And if they do in fact seem overly emotional, think about where that emotion might be coming from. No matter what, everyone deserves to have their voices heard. Finally, we as women must not back down from this fight. To quote the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as women achieve power, the barriers will fall. As society sees what women can do, as women see what women can do, there will be more women out there doing things, and we will all be better off for it. We cannot allow aggression to occur. We need to continue to strive for equality for all. And thus concludes our girl talk. We have made massive strides over the past century when it comes to women's access to public speaking platforms. My hope and goal for the future is to ensure that everyone has access to these remarkable platforms and that everyone's voices are heard. But for now, thank you for coming to my